Okay, so let's talk about frames of coaching next. And as we coach our clients, there are very often times that we'll be using frames or you know, working within frames uh, when we speak to our client. We'll talk about frames more later when we talk about NLP as well. But here's just some examples of frames that we can utilize. And the first one we've got is reasons versus results. And this was one, one that I wrote and essentially is based off the idea of the cause and effect dichotomy, which we spoke about in an earlier video. Now, I love this saying by Mark Twain that says, 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the ones you did. So throw off the bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore and dream. The fact is that many people will give you all the reasons why they don't have what they want. Like, it's a bad economy. I'm too tall. I'm too short. I'm too big. I'm too small. I'm too young. I'm too old. Uh, I was born into a poor family. I was born into a rich family. Whatever the excuse might be. I always ask my, my client the question, you know, imagine you lying on your deathbed and just imagine that as you lay there you've got all these regrets these I shoulda I woulda I coulda is how many times have we heard people say things like I could have done this or I could have done that you know I could have been a contender if only this thing didn't happen to me and it's all reasons for why we don't have what we want remember what we said before Cause and effect is not about putting blame and not about fault. So we never want to put our client at blame or at fault. What we're saying is we want to accept cause and then get the learnings that we need to so we can create the change that we want and move away from this effect side of life where we give all the reasons for why we haven't got what we want. You know, as Thomas Edison famously replied, he said, I didn't fail 10,000 times. I found 10,000 ways not to create the light bulb. And we should always see if we had some failure, something didn't quite work out the way that we wanted. Well, we don't see it as failure. We see it as feedback. It's simply feedback to say, you know what, this thing that I did didn't work. So how do I adapt and change and do it in a different way? As we look at results on page 32, William Jennings Bryan said, Destiny is not a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. It's not something to be waited for, but rather something to be achieved. So let's focus on our results. Let's focus on what is the outcome that I want? How am I going to achieve that? What feedback do I need to take? What learnings do I need to, to take from whatever experience I'm having? Then create my goal as a smart goal. Get my outcome focused and move towards the outcome that I want. The next frame we've got is intention. And so intention is an important factor that moves us along to achievement. Intention helps you to make things happen. You can't borrow somebody else's intention or their goals or their energy. You can, however, be helped to create it through the process of coaching. Often people make promises that they don't keep. They leave themselves with broken agreements that can have a negative effect on them. Or, you know, people say, I'll do it if I can, or I'll try do it. In fact, why don't you... If it's safe to do so, take your pen, put it on your left palm. So hold your hand open, your left hand open, put your pen on your palm. And then take your right hand and try to pick up the pen. And so you either picked it up or you didn't. There's no trying. As Yoda said, there's do or there's not. No try. The intention, if you didn't pick it up, then the intention wasn't there to do it. If you did pick it up, the intention was to do it, and of course you did it. 
How many times have you heard somebody say, I'll try be at the dinner party, or I'll try meet with you later, knowing full well that they wouldn't? In the English language, try almost suggests failure. In fact, when I'm doing hypnosis with a client and I want my client to fail, I say try. I might say, try to open your eyes and notice how they are just so relaxed and won't work. So try to open them, suggesting that you're not going to open them. So thus, we either have the results that we want or we don't. Much of it comes down to our intention. If what you say is what you do, then your word can become the law of your life. Next one, we've got keeping agreements. So often when things aren't working, it may be down to some fundamental agreements being broken. These agreements need to be reworked or changed or remade. This can be evidenced in our personal and business lives. So example, imagine somebody cheating on their husband or their wife. In business, a salesperson that may not be reaching their goals, their sales targets. So they're just simply two examples of where agreements haven't been kept and as such could create problems. So the question is whether both parties want to work out the situation or not. And you can use this formula. Did you know that we have an agreement? Did you know that you broke the agreement? And are you willing to remake the agreement? Uh, resistance versus persistence next. And so when you resist something, like a reoccurring event in your life, it often tends to persistently reoccur. It's like the law of reversed effect that says the harder you consciously try to do something that's governed by the unconscious, the more difficult it becomes. That's like breathing. Try to consistently focus consciously on breathing. It actually becomes difficult because it's not something that the conscious mind should be thinking of. Yes, and you get the reversed effect. On the other hand, the law of concentrated attention is all about your expectations. So concentrating your attention on the idea until it spontaneously realizes itself. You are what you think you are. What you expect to happen generally will happen. This reinforces our belief system that actually might hold us back. So if your conscious and your unconscious minds are in conflict then the unconscious mind generally wins out. So being persistent in achieving your goal and focusing your attention and attention greatly increases your ability to achieve that goal. During the process of coaching, it may be necessary for the client to become aware of what negative things are persisting in their life and what it is that they may want to achieve instead and what changes do they want to make. Thus changing the focus from the negative persisting thing to the positive goal. The next frame is surrender. So it's important for the client to surrender to the coaching process. And it's important for us as a coach to know that not all clients are coachable or are the right place in their life to be coached. So it's virtually impossible to coach somebody who's not willing to surrender to the process. Now, if you think back to the first step within the results coaching model, we looked at the reason for being there. If this was a person who's been sent by a company, or it's a child who's been sent by a parent, or a wife or a husband who's you know, been sent by their spouse, these people might not actually even want to be there. And so... If somebody is not ready to be coached, then there's actually very little that you can do for them. Unless, of course, what we can do is work with them, build rapport, and see how is it possible that they can get benefit from the coaching session. And what would that benefit look like? So, you can build rapport with the client. Say to them, look, seeing as you are here anyway... You know, what would you like to get from this session? What would be a great outcome for you? You know, what's that one area in your life that if you improve that right now would make a great result or have a great impact on your life? And work with them around something that they want to be working with. It's really important to get the client to surrender to the process. 
Now, there are typically two main possibilities why a client is going to be reluctant to surrender to the coaching process, uh, certainly from an organizational point of view. And this is, the client may think that they already know it all and that you can't coach them. Or otherwise, they might think that, you know, they don't have the capabilities or the resources to create any change or, you know, to rise to the challenge that they might need to achieve. So you may have to address issues like they don't know if coaching is for them or they don't understand what coaching is and what it's supposed to do for them or they don't think that they can actually improve or learn to do any better. And, you know, maybe they might feel that they just don't have the energy or the time to be investing into coaching. So again, using rapport, you can go a long way to help the client to surrender to the process and, you know, get the most out of the coaching. Next, the client needs to admit that it's not working. You see, what got us to where we are often is not going to be what's going to help us to get to where we want to go to, you know, to get to the next level. So the client must be willing to admit that some of the things that they're doing at the moment probably are not working or not working as good as they could do. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there for the coaching in the first place. Clients are sometimes reluctant to make this submission and it also goes hand in hand with surrendering to the process. So when something isn't working, what we're saying is that people are very often then pretending not to notice something. And that can be for a number of reasons. So it's useful for the coach to assist the client in creating awareness of what is and what's not working for them. And, you know, we don't do this through telling them, but rather by having them explore options and possibilities for, you know, what's currently going on in their life and what the potential change might bring for them. Next, we've got unfulfilled expectations. And so clients often have unfulfilled expectations or, you know, the results that they wanted are not actually the results that they got. And so as a coach, it's important for us to work with a client to make sure that their goal or their expectations is actually realistic and based on facts. So let's use the example again of somebody who wants to lose 100 pounds. They're probably not going to lose 100 pounds in one to two or three weeks. And so... If somebody comes with that expectation, then it's unrealistic. Unless, of course, they're going for liposuction. But if they're going to do it through a natural weight loss regime, it's not realistic for them to achieve that. So actually being more specific, more realistic, chunking the goal down into smaller pieces, and then, let's say, these 10-pound increments, and celebrating those little victories on route to success. And so, in this case, what happens now is the expectations are being met, the expectations are more realistic, and as they are achieving these little goals, these little mini steps, what that's doing is building on their confidence and their competence to go ahead and achieve the overall breakthrough that they want. Then the last frame for coaching that we'll look at is perceptions projection. Now, we've already discussed this. But it's really, really important for you as a coach to have absolute trust and belief in your client and, you know, that they can actually do what it is that they are setting out to do. If we don't have this belief, if we're not aligned with our client, then, you know, that could lead to the coach projecting negativity or projecting failure out onto the client. So if you've got negative beliefs about your client's ability to achieve their, their success, then you need to get rid of those limiting beliefs. You know, we've got to be very careful that we are not projecting our limiting beliefs and, and emotions and belief about them actually being able to achieve this success. It's also important to understand that we're not there to judge our clients. What we're referring to is, is the following example. If you were to work with a business client and you felt that they were doing something unethical and that you couldn't work with them, then without judgment, you in the coaching relationship, you just say to them, look, you know, I don't believe that I'm the right coach for you. Would you like me to refer you to another coach? Again, it might just be that we are projecting some feelings 
or our values might not be aligned and then we can project uh, our negativity out onto the client. Now, if the client came to you and said, I want to rob a bank, then that might be a different story. And as we discussed before, you might then go to the police and actually mention that this is what's, uh, what the client is wanting to do. Uh, judgment call. Okay, so those are some frames for coaching. And I hope you found them useful. These are just some examples of some of the frames that you could use. And again, I invite you to maybe create your own frame. You know, consider what you can bring to your coaching practice. And, uh, you know, your frame can be either just a single word or it could be one thing versus another thing. Doesn't really matter. Just consider from within the frame how that relates to your coaching practice and to your potential client.